Well, what a day we're having at Tail Air. We were just descended to 5,000 feet on the Victor 157 airway to Holid, and air traffic control just lost their radar. I need to transition from this airway onto the ILS runway 10 left at Fort Lauderdale, and my GPS Direct 2 function isn't working again. I think I need to get my money back on this G1000 piece of sh. So the problem we have is that we can't get radar vectors and this angle is too tight to turn directly onto the localizer. The situation calls for a procedure turn, but all we have is this hold here. Luckily, this is what's called a hold in lieu of a procedure turn, so we're able to use this to turn back around onto the localizer. Phew, I bet you were worried there for a second. The other problem I've decided to inflict upon myself is that the GPS direct function is not available, so I have to identify Holid by conventional technique. To do this, I need to maintain the Victor 157 airway, which is on a 335 radio from the Dolphin VOR. You can see that I have the VOR on Nav 2 here, and I'm using an RMI2 needle to track the 335 radio from Dolphin. So how can I tell when I get to Holid? Well, Holid is on the localizer for runway 10 left here. I happen to have the ILS tuned in for that runway in NAV1, so as soon as the localizer centers, I will be over Holid. When we get to Holid, we then have to join the localizer. Making a right turn is not possible due to the angle which would cause us to overshoot the turn unless we used an excessive bank angle. This is where the hold comes in. Let's assume that I've been cleared for the approach. I now have to join the hold in order to complete the necessary course reversal to join the final. So the question now is what hold entry is it? If you need more time to work that out, you can pause the video. If you still can't work it out, you can watch my video on hold joins, which is available on the channel and I'll link it in the description. So that's it, time's up and here's the overlay. Now you can see here that it's falling on the edge between a teardrop and a direct entry. I'm going to do the teardrop. So here's the localizer coming in, and if you have a look over here on the moving map, you can see that Holid is pretty close by. So this technique's actually got us close enough to Holid, and this is over zoom, so it actually looks a little bit worse than it is track wise. So for the teardrop entry, then for a left turn hold, we're going to turn to a track which is 30 degrees more than the outbound track of the hold. Fly up that for one minute, wind adjusted, and then make a left turn back to the inbound track, which is the final approach in this case, or the localizer. So the outbound track here will be 306, which is 276 plus 30. I'm going to take a couple of degrees off that because we've got a slight quartering left tailwind, so maybe go for about 304 or something like that. So I've started the timing and you can see on the wind vector here we've got about 8 knots, which is about 20 or 30 degrees off the tail. So I'm going to fly outbound for a little bit less than a minute. I'm going to take about 5 seconds off that, so I'll go for about 55 seconds and then I'll start my turn to the inbound. Once we've completed the initial join, we don't have to go around the hold again unless our clearance specified that we did. We can then just continue straight in for the approach after that. Once we're on the localizer, we can use a more accurate method to identify Holid. You can see there's a DME distance published here of 20.8 nautical miles when established on the localizer. This is way more accurate than using a VOR radio from some miles away. So the time is around 50 seconds now, so I'm now getting ready to make that left turn back to the inbound. Now we're established in the turn, we need to keep an eye on the HSI course deviation and adjust the turn as required to intercept the localizer. We also need to be aware of the wind situation. So according to the PFD wind vector, the wind is coming from the southeast at around 8 knots. The final approach track is 096 degrees, which means a slight crosswind from the right. I'm therefore expecting to need a heading slightly more than 096 in order to maintain the localizer. So as we're passing through south here, you can see the localizer is starting to come alive. The CDI is starting to move in towards the middle. So now what I'm doing is I'm just keeping an eye on that and having a look at whether I need to either continue the turn, slow the turn down, or stop the turn. It's uh, rare that your rate one turn will get you exactly onto the localizer first time, so you will have to make some adjustments in order to achieve that. So here, for example, I can see that if I continue the turn any further, I'm going to end up paralleling the localizer, which I don't want to do. So I'm going to roll out here on a heading of around 110, and if I just keep the wings level here for a few seconds, you'll see the localizer start to move in towards the middle again. 
And that's the thing with instrument flying, it's all about patience. So we just need to just sit here and wait, rather than correct in the opposite direction, which is completely unnecessary, and we'll just end up in us having to make a large correction in the opposite direction, and we'll end up kind of snaking down the localizer. It's better to just hold the wings level, wait for this to come into the middle, which you can see is just about getting there now, and then selecting a heading that's going to maintain it. So I've bugged a heading of 096 for now, which is the final approach track. But I am expecting the wind to require a heading of approximately, probably about 100 uh, in order to maintain the localizer. So I'm going to set that initially and then uh, see how that works out. Make a correction if I need to. And then I'll bug the new heading after that. So we're just coming up to that 20.8 DME there on the localizer. And you can see on the moving map here that we are pretty much bang over Hollet. So that does show you that this is a much more accurate way of fixing that position. And now we're over Holid. You can see on the chart here that we had to be at 5,000 feet for this bit. But uh, now, after Holid, we can descend to 4,000 or above for the next intersection, which is Gamvi. And that's at 13.9 DME, or the radial 356 from the uh, Dolphin VOR. Uh, so we've still got the Dolphin VOR tuned, so we can use that as well as a cross-check. Uh, but I'll be using the DME mainly because it's more accurate, like I said before. So we'll be looking for 13.9 DME for Gamvi. We've got around 7 miles here to lose 1,000 feet for the Gamvi intersection. So we don't need to descend at too great a rate. So what I've done is I've just reduced the power by a few hundred RPM to give us around a three or 400 feet per minute rate of descent. Seeing as we've got the time here, I might as well brief you on the further step downs after Gamvi. Uh, so after Gamvi, which is the 13.9 DME point, we can descend to 3,000 or above for the Warra intersection here, which is at 10.7 DME. And then after that, 6.9 DME for the Novi intersection, uh, which is the final approach fix for the ILS there. You can see we need to be 1,800 or above. And that's the intercept point for the glide slope. So I haven't set the minimums yet in the G1000 bug references here. So I'm going to do that now. You can see here on the chart the minimums for the ILS are 207 for all approach categories of aircraft. Uh, this goes up in 10 increments, so I'm going to set 210 on there, which is close enough to 207 for me. And that'll just be a little prompt as we get a bit closer to decide whether we want to continue the approach or not, depending on whether we're visual. Here's the weather for Fort Lauderdale here, so you can see that we've got a slight wind from the north, so a slight crosswind for landing, visibility is looking good, and the cloud bases are pretty high as well, so there shouldn't be an issue with us getting visual, so we should be able to land off this approach. So as you can see here, we're coming up to the 13.9 DME point, which is the Gamvi intersection. You can also see we can cross-check it with the radial 356 from the Dolphin VOR, which you can see on the RMI needle on the tail end here. And then we can have a look at the next point on the chart, which is that Warra point, which is 10.7 DME. And we can go down to 3000 or above after we get past the 13.9 DME. So there we go, we're now past the 13.9 DME point, so I've reduced the power and we are now descending to 3,000 feet for the next intersection. So for this one we've got 1,000 feet to lose, we've got 3.1 miles to lose it, uh, which at this speed is going to be around 2 minutes uh, for us. So we're looking at around 500 feet per minute to lose that 1,000 feet for the Warra intersection. So that's what I'm going to set. The next altitude step down after Warra is going to be this Nove intersection and you can see here it's labeled as 1800 or above. Now if you have a look on the profile view here you can see there's a little lightning bolt. That signifies the final approach fix for a precision approach. Now we're doing an ILS approach which is a precision approach. So this is the point we can expect to intercept the ILS and we would do that at 1800 feet if we're on this profile. Speaking about being on the profile, you can see that we're coming up to the 10.7 DME point here for the Warra intersection, and I am a little high. I'm still a couple of hundred feet above the 3000. So I've actually reduced the power and dipped the nose a little bit more in order to re-achieve that approach profile. Otherwise, I'm gonna end up above the glide slope at the intercept, which is not ideal. 
So as you can see on the vertical speed indicator here, I'm going for about 750 to 800 feet per minute. Now a three degree glide slope requires about five times the ground speed. Uh, so going around 90 knots, we'll be looking at 450 feet per minute for a three degree glide slope. So this is perfectly sufficient to be able to get us back onto that profile. And you can actually see the glide slope on the PFD here. And it's showing us a little bit higher than we uh, should be but uh, it's looking okay at the moment. That 100 heading seems to be working out quite well for the localizer as well. But as we descend, the speed of the wind will probably reduce, or it may actually flip around because we know that the wind on the ground is from the north. So we might very well need to make adjustments to the heading to maintain the localizer, depending on how variable this wind is. So I think I've pretty much got the aircraft back on the correct approach profile now. And looking at the glide slope indication here, it's in the middle. Uh, so I'd say we're looking pretty good. Now if I just follow this glide slope down, it should take me to 1800 feet at the Nova intersection, which is the ILS intercept final approach fix, which is the lightning bolt on the approach plate there. So we're just going to follow that down and see if that happens. And there's 6.9 DAB and 1800 feet. Perfect. Now we're on the ILS approach. So what we do now is pitch for the glide slope, make left and right adjustments for the localizer, and power adjustments for the speed. The ground speed's 90 knots thereabouts, so we will multiply that by 5 to give us the rate of descent required to maintain the glide slope. So we're looking at 450 feet per minute. So we're going to set that as a target on the vertical speed indicator, uh, but we won't use that too much because it's quite laggy. And the best idea with this is if you're transient don't look at the vertical speed indicator but if you're established then it's a good thing to look at just to make sure you're achieving the right rate. So I just noticed that I've drifted slightly left of the localizer so I'm just going to correct to the right by a couple of degrees and uh, hopefully that should bring it back in. The configuration I'm using here is flaps 10 and a 90 knot speed for the approach and you'll see here that 1800 rpm and a pitch just below the horizon maintains that pretty well and uh, that will give us the approximate rate of descent that we'll need to maintain the glide slope. These are pretty good reference values and then you can adjust up or down as necessary to achieve the actual glide slope. I'm still a little left of the localizer so I'm just going to make another adjustment to the right to try and get that back into the middle. doesn't need to be a big adjustment, just a couple of degrees, and that seems to have done the trick. Uh, so you can see there that the localizer is now back in the middle, so I need to come to the left now by a degree or two in order to maintain it. And you see, while I was distracted by the localizer, that wind's done a cheeky little swivel around to a tailwind, which is going to get me above the glide slope unless I do something about it. So that's something to keep an eye on as well. You'll see here that the ground speed's gone up to about 97 knots, which is going to need more like a 500 feet per minute reference rate of descent, and maybe a little bit more if the wind does carry us through the glide slope. And you can see here now that it's gone around to a quartering left crosswind tailwind situation. So it's actually opposite to what we had before. So we might find now that it starts to push us onto the south side of the localizer rather than the north side that it was pushing us towards the whole time down the approach before. Kind of makes sense really given that the wind's coming from the north on the ground. And there you go, see I haven't quite corrected enough and therefore the wind's actually now pushing us through the localizer onto the south side so you're starting to see a left deviation now on the course deviation indicator on the HSI. So I'm going to have to make a left turn in order to counteract for that. Just coming up to 100 above the decision altitude now, so I'm going to start to transition my view to outside and see if I can get visual with the runway. And the weather's good enough today, so we should be able to see what we're doing. And uh, there we go. So if we have a look out the window there, we can see we've got two reds and two whites on the pappies, and we should be good to configure for the landing and continue. So I've made a power reduction there to slow the aircraft down, and then uh, 85 knots, I can go for four flaps and configure the aircraft for landing and now we're just continuing visually from here. I'm just getting a little bit of sync there so I've just added a little bit of power aiming for 65 knots as we approach the threshold there and it looks like I've got about 69 knots over the threshold there I'm going to avoid making a joke about that today 
personal growth. Please excuse the swerve, but Microsoft Flight Simulator has absolutely no idea how airplanes handle on the ground in light crosswinds. And that was the hold in lieu of a procedure turn, followed by the procedural ILS approach. Thanks for watching, and for those of you who did make it this far in the video, once again, I don't know why you do it to yourself.